that I know we've had various conversations during the day about sort of how much money is being invested in clean energy in the US and how much is in basic research and is how much is in other kinds of things and I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, this but we created along with the Breakthrough Institute a very cool uh, a cool tool uh, it's the basically it's the energy innovation tracker and it's a tool that you can get on energyinnovation.us and you, you find on that is essentially a master database of every single project that the federal government funds in clean energy uh, and it'll have it by by type of technology by uh, area in the in the in the innovation process um, and it's such a cool technology that actually DOE uses it uh, to figure out what they're actually doing uh, which I sort of find bizarre in a way that uh, that we created this tool that they find useful but again very useful it's called the energy innovation tracker it's energyinnovation.us so uh, I want to jump into the, the the next panel which is we've we've been having a conversation uh, premised in part upon uh, a key role for the federal government and a key role in terms of making uh, critical investments and central question now obviously is how do we do that in a time of fiscal austerity uh, where people are talking about cutting uh, not expanding so that's really the focus of this panel and we're really pleased that Coral Davenport uh, can join us as the moderator. Coral is the energy and environment correspondent for the National Journal uh, prior to that, uh, prior to joining National Journal 2000, I think Coral's the only person who's actually gone this direction. Uh, she was at Politico and went to National <laughs> Journal. I think it's almost everybody's going to Politico, and she decided to buck the trend. Uh, before that, she was with Congressional Quarterly. Uh, she writes about everything from global climate change policy to offshore drilling to the economics of renewable energy. In 2010, she was a fellow with the Metcalf Institute for Marine and Environmental Reporting. And 2001-2004, she worked in Athens uh, as a correspondent for publications like the Christian Science Monitor and USA Today. So thank you, Coral. Thank you. Um, we'll just quickly, briefly go through uh, introductions and um, have each one of you give about a five-minute opening statement and then jump uh, right into some Q&A and hopefully a lively discussion. Uh, Lou Milford is president and founder of the Clean Energy Group and the Clean Energy States Alliance. Uh, both are nonprofit organizations that work with state, federal, and international organizations to promote clean ener energy technologies. Uh, Travis Doom, actually, over there. Um, so, moving down, sorry. Peter Rothstein uh, is, is president of the New England Clean Energy Council. He leads the council's regional innovation cluster strategy and initiatives. Uh, Travis Doom is a program specialist at the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcome. Uh, Jesse Jenkins is director of energy and climate policy at the Breakthrough Institute. He is the lead author or co-author of uh, reports such as Make Clean Energy Cheap, Rising Tigers Sleeping Giant, Asian Nations Set Out to Dominate the Clean Energy Race, um, Jump Starting a Clean Energy Revolution with the National Institute of Energy, uh, and the National Energy Education Act Policy Proposal. Uh, so, Lou, let's let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, thanks very much, Carol. Thanks to the uh, co-sponsors here. Uh, I want to give a, kind of a federalist perspective uh, on um, clean energy innovation. This is what maybe Rick Perry might have said during that 18-second uh, Rosemary Wood uh, tape recording lapse. Uh, if he was really a principled federalist uh, with kind of a nuanced sense of uh, energy policy and finance and and an understanding that his state actually is the state with the largest amount of wind capacity in the country. And there are a couple of facts that he might have been thinking about during that, during that period. Uh, let me touch on states, commercialization, uh, using other people's money, uh, which is sort of part of the story. Uh, and also the fact that, and I haven't heard this said today, although it touched on, uh, that we're dealing with an industry that's very different from every other industry and in that it's heavily regulated uh, monopoly uh, utility regulated industry for the most part uh, that's been around for 120 years. I mean those are key contextual facts when we're talking about uh, moving new technologies or even incremental technologies into the market. A couple facts about states. 
Uh, state, for the most part, the industries you see today, solar, wind, typically renewables, exist today because the states have been doing this for the last 10 years, uh, have invested about $4 billion of their own money, uh, have leveraged about another $9 billion. 30 states have mandates on utilities. Uh, there have been now new economic development programs in states. States are beginning to go upstream, beginning to make equity investments in companies, uh, actually making investments in early stage technologies. Uh, and <clears throat> you also are starting to see utilities, for better or worse, depends on how one, one thinks about this, uh, getting into the ownership of some of these technologies, solar particularly. Uh, so that's the world in which we are in, and I think the key point I want to make, and I want to make a number of very specific points, uh, just to get people thinking, um, is that all of the investments that we are talking about uh, in early stage innovation uh, really won't matter unless we have those technologies commercialized, unless they make it into the marketplace. Uh, so if you're not linking those early stage uh, activities to later stage uh, market creation, market development, and commercialization. We've spent a lot of good money and a lot of good ideas, but we haven't changed the world. Uh, first thing in terms of institutional framework, uh, I think Alexis asked, you know, what would you do with DOE? Uh, would you change it if you were starting from ground zero? Uh, I think it's an opportunity to think about that seriously rather than to dismiss it as something that just can't be done. I mean, when I look at RPE and look at the hubs, I think what you see are small-scale disruptive institutional models uh, that uh, could be the basis to actually reform the way at least all of the clean energy activities in the agency now uh, are undertaken. That hasn't happened. I'm not sure that anybody has the gumption to do it. Uh, but I think something small, nimble, more cooperative, more linked to states um, is the way the energy police has to work. Uh, so that's one thought, uh, a completely new disruptive model for doing uh, clean energy at the federal level. You know, DOE doesn't have an innovation office. I mean, it has ARPA doing good things, it has the hubs. But uh, I'd say across the board, like a corporation would, um, you really don't have a systematic approach um, to new ways to do technology innovation. I mean, technologies today are doing joint product development uh, through something called open innovation. Uh, they are not uh, basically working in silos. It's not the Bell Lab system anymore. Uh, it's not working with a bunch of smart people in one room. It's basically working in a global innovation marketplace, much like, uh, uh, much like uh, the Clean Air Task Force fellow said before. Uh, so. That, I think, is, is key. And what that will mean is linking uh, early stage innovation to later stage commercialization. Uh, RPE, the big difference, the problem with RPE, I mean, it's a great program, but unlike DARPA, its model, uh, it doesn't have a customer. Uh, and I know there's a lot of interest in this, but I think unless there's a systematic link between the RPE program investments and ultimate commercialization of those technologies, uh, we may have a problem on our hands with a lot of stranded early stage investments. Uh, I know there's interest in working with the states, interest in working with more companies. Uh, my view is that that's gotta, that, that should happen yesterday um, and that there should be an effort to link uh, those with financing downstream, use of IP, uh, and commercialization strategies. Decentralization finance. Uh, Jesse put up a slide, or, or actually his colleague with Breakthrough put up a slide uh, about the potential tail off of federal support, investment tax credits, IPCs. Uh, I don't see people working very aggressively on plan B other than simply saying this is the way the world's going to be. Uh, it seems to me that we should again be doing that yesterday. Uh, one, one avenue is to start thinking about the way in which we finance infrastructure in the U.S. today, uh, hospitals, bridges, roads, you name it. Uh, and it's basically done with a lot of other tax uh, financing mechanisms, bond financing. Uh, I think t unless we move this technology into that financial space, we're going to have problems. We need to think of different ways uh, to get technologies, particularly renewable technologies, off the tax equity stream. Uh, I think most people who are in the business know that's a fairly unstable, small foundation. Uh, we've got to figure out a new way to finance this stuff. And that gets into, you know, basically, you know, the, the kind of the valley of death utility role for this. And I think that's, that's what's really critical here. I think we underestimate 
uh, what we need to do to get these technologies to commercial scale, again in the U.S. Uh, you know, the only reason why we have the electric power system we have today, coal, oil, and the like, is because 120 years ago when Edison was building his central generation plants, he couldn't finance them. That was his problem. His problem was that he had a new technology uh, that he couldn't get customers to buy. Sound familiar? So what did he do? He hired a very smart lawyer uh, and actually proposed the idea of monopoly regulation, uh, and which then became the standard by which uh, his technologies were commercialized. In effect, you know, monopoly regulation was Edison's way to force capital accumulation. Uh, and to force the financing of his technologies. Uh, so we're, here we are 120 years later. We want to flip the technology. We still have those models in place. Uh, we can mandate utilities to do various things. They've, we've done it with renewable portfolio standards. It seems to me we, can be, we could do it uh, with new technologies as well. We need to come up with ways to do it. We did a report with Bloomberg that suggested some of this, ways to sort of traverse the valley of death using mandates on technologies and reverse auction mechanisms so that you know, you're not spending more than you have to uh, to get those technologies going forward. Um, a couple of other things that I think are need, needed to be done for new technologies as well. If you look along the East Coast, probably the, the most significant renewable opportunity is offshore wind. There's been a lot of controversy around the Cape Wind project. Uh, but most of the states along the east, except for Connecticut and Florida, have a wind resource. Uh, gigawatt potential, multi-gigawatt potential. Many of these states are interested, and we're working with many of them, uh, basically to look at kind of a market creation exercise. How do you coordinate states to do joint procurement? Uh, how do you finance multiple, uh, multiple sites all along the east coast? Um, how do you get DOD to commit? Um, how do you bring down the cost of capital? Uh, but most importantly, how do you figure out, how do you split the, the supply chain? Um, uh, Massachusetts may benefit from more port facilities, uh, more technology development may happen in, in New Jersey uh, by, uh, by building, uh, manufacturing uh, turbines. I think this is a major opportunity uh, and, and a kind of a different collaborative model for doing market creation that could, could bring in new technologies. The new technology in that area is likely to be floating turbines. There's one in the world, in, in Amsterdam, um, but it, chances are that's where this industry is going to go. We know how to do it with oil and gas. The issue is transferring that uh, know-how uh, to the offshore wind industry in the U.S. Uh, enormous potential, a lot of economic development opportunity. Korea's doing it, China's doing it. You know, this is a competitive world, we can do it here too. Uh, economic development. Uh, states increasingly are moving beyond the model of just financing individual projects but are looking to see how they can go up the chain to support new technology, support innovation. Uh, Connecticut, Mass, many other states are doing this. They also are now starting to put in place in more conventional economic development programs, uh, analyzing what jobs do you have in your state, what's your industry look like. Massachusetts just released a, uh, a report a couple weeks ago, 64,000 jobs in the state uh, that they consider in the clean energy sector. That's about 2% of the jobs, not bad. I, th I think my, it's my time almost uh, getting, getting to be there. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm about over with this, but I, I'll just finish with that uh, and just add one last point on, on the international side. I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, in fact, I think you see with a lot of developing countries, there's a term called reverse innovation where many developing countries are doing low-cost product development like LED solar lighting for off-grid uh, and then selling those technologies back to the north. So rather than the idea that the north to south technology transfer is the way we're going to solve climate, chances are it's going to be, as it's termed, from the rest to the west. So I'll finish there. Great. Peter? Thanks. I'm Peter Rothstein. And um, actually, I appreciate the, the sequence here, because in many ways, I get to be the corollary to what Lou was talking about um, you know, from the state side. And, and I represent a, a business nonprofit trade member and economic development organization, and we're now part of a, a series of counterparts around the country who are in many ways the public, the, the, uh, the, the private sector partner, public-private approaches that Lou is describing. Um, so how are some of the, in many ways, what I see going on at the states, and we've got you know, a little bit of the backdrop. Uh, in New England, the, the New England Clean Energy Council has 400 
uh, companies uh, who are members or affiliates across the six states, and it is across all six states. There's, there's innovation going on, there's new inventions, there's startups, there's market activity going on across all six states. Uh, and in many ways, this feeds into some of the discussion from earlier today, um, there is interaction of the economies of the six states that say in many ways for an emerging uh, sector like like clean energy, uh, we are we are an, we are a cluster in many ways, uh, and that's the way that a lot of the businesses are starting to grow. Um, what's what's been going on in, in, across our region? Uh, we know how how diverse and how just in many ways differentiated the the energy economies are across this country with different natural resources, different comparative advantages in different industries, uh, different uh, infrastructures. Uh, different, uh, different labs and universities and, and, and companies who are creating some of the new inventions and expertise to help both invent but, but develop certain types of technologies. Uh, and as well, and perhaps even more importantly, uh, around the country we see different opportunities for early adoption markets. And that's such a critical part of the innovation system. I, I really appreciate the discussion we've been having about innovation not as a, you know, as just as a process or as a, you know, stage gate process from A to B and C, but as a system as with feedback loops and interaction. And a lot of that needs to be less technology push and more market pull. That has to happen by being close to markets, being close to the problems that you're trying to solve. And in many situations, the, you know, that means having inventors with entrepreneurs, with investors, with early adoption customers who see the opportunity for strategic advantage or problem resolution through adopt, being an early adopter of these new innovations. That's what's going on in the regions. Um, we look across a place like New England. Uh, we are an ISO. We have an electricity market across the six states. We're trying to address uh, new models for smart grid for grid scale storage, uh, for, for how to price demand response into, a, into our, our electricity markets. Uh, we have in our geography, Lou was talking about offshore wind. That's not a single state industry to develop, clearly. Um, and some of the infrastructure that, that will be developed can be developed and actually the states are working on, on mechanisms to do joint development of some of the siting, some of the port opportunities, some of the test facilities, uh, ways to connect some of the, you know, the, the bulk building industry in Maine who have all sorts of materials expertise that can be applied to turbine blades. How do you connect that to some of the manufacturing and uh, expertise that may be elsewhere across New England? Um, we, have, we have other adoption market opportunities around vehicle electrification on the grid with the, you know, with the density of the Boston to New York corridor. Those are the kind of, so we look at those opportunities and we say, how can we not only try to promote projects that might get RPE funding, uh, but how can we also connect those projects to customers, entrepreneurs, investors, test sites, uh, and early, early markets, and then create some of the regional policy frameworks that would smooth the way for those types of technologies to have market signals. And we all know that the market signals that are working these days are the state RPS programs, uh, the state energy efficiency programs. Uh, Reggie at the current pricing is not sending much of a market signal because, because we've already done such a good job at frankly lowering carbon emissions through a variety of mechanisms including some of the economic downturn and, and, the, and the change over to natural gas. Uh, but it's the state, these state initiatives are creating a lot of the mechanisms that are helping to create pricing signals and financing. Um, so th what's going on in the state, I, a lot of the states I think are in many ways sort of pilot or seed efforts that are happening in many situations as public-private partnerships. Mike Schwenk was talking about some of the efforts at, at PNNL. Mark Cummings, one of your colleagues there, I know we work together because he's, he's doing some work in, in Washington State and Washington and Oregon are looking at what they can do together. These are efforts that are going on across the country. Um, in our situation, so we are a nonprofit business-led organization, but we also have, we have a 501c3 uh, innovation uh, um, organization that is a partner to the six New England states. Uh, there were mention of the, the DOE Innovation Ecosystem Program, the I-6 Green Program that the Department of Commerce has. Uh, we, we won, uh, we're participating in two of those, both of those programs um, that are just getting off the ground, where the whole goal, 
with I6 Green in specific, we have 40 partners, including all six states, 15 universities, incubators, venture firms, utilities as early customers. The goal is how do we connect the early innovation project that might still be in labs, that might be in early stage companies, to entrepreneurs, to, mar to markets, to customer advisory councils, uh, to financing strategy, to policy strategy that will help them create a business model so they know what kind of target and what sort of long-term economics they need to hit. How do we create, how do we connect those projects as well to test beds across New England? Um, so that there's ways to accelerate those the proof of concept and, and at least the early commercialization. We're not going to solve the scale up uh, valley of death and commercialization valley of death just as a single state or as a small region. We need to have strong federal partnership to do that and international partnerships as well. But, but the work that's going on across the states is, is, is where a lot of the action is. And frankly, I think the, the natural partner for all of us are governors. Because they're all, the, the, this issue is much less partisan at the state level. Uh, the governors are all seeing the, the opportunities for new company creation, job creation, new markets, uh, and, and innovation opportunities in their states and in their regions. Uh, so I think there's great partnership opportunities there. One other thing I wanted to briefly mention, we have a, I think we put a press release copy out on the table there. Uh, last week there was a new organization announced uh, called Advanced Energy Economy. Uh, we are part of, the New England Energy Council is one of four uh, regional chapters of this new national organization which was set up to, in a sense, create groups like us across all 50 states, either by state by state or multi-state groups like us, depending upon how those, those regions and clusters lay out. Uh, we have efforts underway in more than half of the states right now uh, because these activities are going on, but they're nascent. They're very small, they're way undercapitalized. Um, we're a five-year-old organization with five people and we've been around longer than anybody else doing what we're doing. Um, however, uh, there are hundreds of groups who are starting to partner with states, universities, and others to help accelerate these, these early market opportunities. And frankly, I think this is a way to bring the federal partner in as the, the, the federal government as a partner to the way the U.S. economy works, which is not one monolithic top-down economy. We are a highly distributed, innovative, entrepreneurial economy with many things happening bottom-up. And I think energy needs to be transformed to work that way as well. Great. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to offer a few remarks uh, about the Department of Defense and not so much about what we can learn about the Department of Defense, uh, for example, like how we try to uh, recreate DARPA through RPE, um, but what can the Department of Defense actually do itself. And so of course they're already actually doing quite a bit and um, I also don't really want to go over that because the fact is this idea has become so popular now that this information can really be found out anywhere, what they're up to, the types of programs they're pursuing. Um, and even the sort of institutional attributes that set the Department of Defense apart are sort of becoming better known and um, we're sort of always hearing these common examples of DOD innovation from history. Um, and so I don't really want to focus on those things because I think um, they're sort of out there. People hear about them regularly now. Um, and so I have this one slide here and I think it's going to sort of help us actually get away from that. And if I was going to describe this slide in a single sentence, I'd say something like, uh, the DOD rationale for energy innovation varies for different technologies. And so this is a very simple idea, but the term energy security seems to have completely obscured this fact. And in my perspective, this seems to cause problems. So the first problem is that um, different institutional attributes uh, of DOD will be better leveraged for different technologies. And then the second problem is that wrapping all these different rationales together invites anyone to come and punch holes in the argument. Okay, and so both of these problems are evident in the controversy now surrounding alternative fuels. So for example, if the Navy wants to purchase cost um, if the Navy wants to purchase cost-competitive alternative fuels, then procurement is going to provide much less leverage than it has done in the historic examples of innovation we're all so familiar with. Um, and if we agree that alternative fuels do not provide a tactical advantage, then the uncertainties surrounding strategy and cost become absolutely critical to building support for programs like these. And so those are the sort of details that get lost when you bundle things together under terms like energy security. Um, so it's important to pull out those details. 
Okay, and then another key part of this figure here is this dotted line that separates broader goals like competitiveness and clean energy from the core mission of DOD, like tactical and strategic capabilities, and more recently, their budgetary concerns. And so this sort of separation leads to the obvious question, um, isn't DOD already managing its perceived needs? So like, what is the call to action? How do we actually move across this dotted line? And it seems to me that this is the question that all too often goes unanswered. And most likely the reason is because the first step toward answering a question like this is inescapably being precise about what one is advocating for. Um, so it was actually refreshing to hear some of Sam's comments. He was pretty unapologetic about the environment being the concern of him and his organization. And that brings a great deal of clarity to the types of technologies you're interested in and the types of uh, things you try to leverage. So I think it's a mistake to think that this step to reveal explicit intent can be avoided. And the reason is ener energy innovation is the means and not the end. And it's a mistake to sort of circumvent this step by purporting that energy innovation is sort of a win, 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 win. Uh, the fact is design trade-offs are real and DOD has to make these decisions. And so the reality is that the objectives for national security, the economy, and the environment can contradict or compete as easily as they complement or remain separate from one another. So um, in short, I would say that smart energy policies that are going to leverage DOD won't hide behind terms like energy security. They won't assume that technologies can cross over this dotted line on their own, and they won't be contingent on 21st century military transformations. Um, so I want to be very brief and uh, with the hope that some of, some of these things will be a, at least a little provocative and, and, and bring about some good questions from, from you all out there. And um, that's sort of the reason behind leaving this table blank like this, because what's important is, at least initially, is not to get into some debate about what fits where. You know, is this technology uh, driven by budget concerns that then become strategic concerns? or something like that sort. The first step is to acknowledge that making these separations are useful. They provide clarity and they're gonna help us make decisions about the types of things we uh, pursue. Thanks. Great. Great. Jesse. Uh, Jesse Jenkins, the Breakthrough Institute. I wanted to uh, bring a couple of different uh, topics into the discussion here. I think you know, taking the state and regional perspective, um, it, we're moving out to a federal policy perspective, what the role of the federal government is in both establishing a national innovation system and also help in, in recognizing that our country uh, is not one monolith, but rather consisting of many regional economies. How do we support, um, as a partner, um, the, the great work that's going on in regional economies and state economies throughout the country? So the first of these concepts um, is that at the public level, well, you know, obviously we're consumed by the budget debate here in Washington. Uh, everybody's waiting for the super committee to either blow up in complete failure or to come down um, with an ax on all of the uh, budgets in, um, in the federal budget. Uh, and I think that there's a real fundamental problem with the debate that's going on right now that we've actually documented in the report, uh, America's three deficits that we put out with um, our colleagues at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation earlier this month. And that's that in the budget debate and in the rules that govern Congress uh, created by the Congressional Budget Office to sort of figure out what the impact on the federal budget is of various uh, programs or expenditures. There is no effort made in that discussion to differentiate between what might be a productive public investment that actually increases economic growth and therefore draws future revenues back into the federal government from those expenditures that might be more consumptive. They, ha um, they fund current consumptive uh, needs that may or may not be necessary, um, but, but whether they are or not certainly don't have a major long-term impact on our economic strength. Um, so, can you imagine if a, if a, a business uh, looked at their balance sheets this way? There was just simply sales over here, and it brought in a certain amount of money, uh, and then there was a bunch of expenditures, and they didn't care what the relationship was between those expenditures and the sales uh, that they were having on the other side. And so, you know, pizza party for the staff, sure, same thing as, uh, you know, redoubling uh, your productivity on the manufacturing floor. That's how the Congressional Budget Office governs the policy debate around the budget in Washington, and that policy debate governs everything else. Um, so I think if we're going to talk about smart energy policies in a time of budget austerity, I think we need to start talk by talking about smart budget policies in a time of budget austerity. Um, because we cannot close all three of the deficits that America faces today if we don't make that distinction. The first is obviously the budget deficit, but equally important to our long-term economic security is the trade deficit, 
which has grown um, tremendously over the last uh, last 30 years since we last in, uh, experienced a trade surplus, and our investment deficit, the underinvestment that we've been sustaining since about 1980 across the board in education, research and development and technology investments and infrastructure across the country. Um, and so I think we need to start uh, from there and look at um, how we can situate energy policies that actually act as productive investments that help close our trade deficit, close the investment gap, boost innovation, productivity, and competitiveness, and therefore uh, drive economic growth that will help us close the budget deficit. Okay, so that's the first con uh, concept. We've got to change the debate around the budget deficit. Uh, the second is that when we're looking at um, the investments that we need to make um, across the board in the energy innovation system, um, I think we need to recognize that however effective we are at having a smarter budget debate, there is a limited public tolerance either for large-scale public subsidies or expenditures or for significantly increased energy prices. I think we're seeing that right now, obviously, with the tough debates around every single item in the budget. Uh, I think we also saw the, the we also see routinely are the public's uh, lack of tolerance for increased energy prices. Uh, we saw that in the cap and trade debate uh, in the last Congress. I think we see that every time gas prices spike. All of the pressure that our political economy places on elected officials is to keep energy prices low, not raise them through public policies. So we have to figure out how to to make, uh, make good uh, use of limited public resources or limited public tolerance for higher energy prices to drive the cost down of the technologies that we need to, to deploy en masse, um, both in the United States and globally, in order to meet our energy, economic, or climate or environmental objectives. Um, and I wanted to plug a, a great uh, a handout that uh, Letha Tani and the World Resource Institute's uh, Two Degrees of Innovation Project has out on the tables back here, which is the power of innovation. Um, and in this context, this is really important because what this shows is we need to, you know, we've had this debate of is it, we need more R&D or we need more deployment or can we just wait for these learning curves um, to go forward. I think we all have been saying throughout the day it's far more complicated than that. We have a system here. It's not a stage gate process and there aren't these sort of discrete stages. Um, we need a system that's all geared towards innovation and that includes gearing our deployment policies towards innovation. If we don't do that, here's a great example. If we had tried to uh, meet 12% of global energy needs um, with solar power by 2050, which is consistent with the uh, International Energy Agency uh, formula for uh, climate uh, emissions reductions, uh, with 1982 technology, it would have cost us $53.5 trillion. So that's if we just said, you know, we had all the technologies we need then, we can sort of stop with current generation technology and just try to deploy, deploy, deploy. But it costs us $53.5 trillion. If we use today's technology, or 2008 technologies, it would cost us about $8.5 trillion. So we've already moved down one, a whole order of magnitude. And if we continue to optimize this entire innovation system, including the incentives created by our deployment policies to drive innovation through, um, through the next uh, few years, if we heat the goals of the SunShot program, for example, to get uh, the installed uh, cost per modules down to 50 cents per watt it would cost us 1.5 trillion dollars. So almost a whole other order of magnitude reduction. And I want to talk about the Moore's Law for solar or Moore's Law for these uh, technologies. Let's go look at what makes Moore's Law a law. It's not actually a law, of course. Um, it's a trend that an entire industry is geared around meeting. All of the market incentives created in the semiconductor industry um, demand and reward the firms that innovate and stay on the cutting edge of Moore's Law. It, it, if you're a computer uh, uh, manufacturer and you're counting on semiconductors, uh, you're, you're, you're the customer for semiconductors, you're designing your product for two years from now assuming that Moore's Law will happen. And the firms that can deliver that performance improvement over time are the ones you're going to buy product from. The firms that fail to do that, they're out of the market. They're going to lose market share and they're gone. And so you have a, a technology sector in the semiconductor industry that invests 20% of all of their revenues back into new product development and incremental and breakthrough R&D every single year. The statistic for the energy sector as a whole is about 0.3% of revenues back into R&D. It's probably a lot better for a solar company, but I doubt it's 20%. So we need to think about, we're, you know, we're creating the market incentives uh, for these technologies with public policies, with these deployment policies, with renewable portfolio standards in states, with tax credits at the federal level. I think we need to think about how do you create then market incentives through those policies that make the solar industry look more like the semiconductor industry, that make uh, next generation nuclear power or next generation uh, uh, wind power have the same kinds of incentives uh, for continual improvement uh, as you see in the semiconductor industry and that requires I think a broader rethink of how we do deployment policy. I helped pass and, and work on the renewable portfolio standard in Oregon State and I can tell you the number of times that we talked about how that policy was going to be designed to drive innovation. Never. 
was not a design criteria for those policies. Um, and I think that's, you know, if we're not going to design these things uh, to drive innovation, why should we su be surprised if they're not fully optimized to do that? So I think there needs to be a serious conversation at the federal level about how do we make good use of our limited resources and our li limited public tolerance uh, to invest in these technologies and make sure that as we're investing, we're driving down prices so that we can reduce the amount of public tolerance we need to drive their widespread deployment. Thanks. Great. So we are in this environment of tremendous fiscal austerity. It's clear that the limited funding that's already available for renewable energy, R&D, production tax credits, loan guarantees, and we'll definitely spend a little time talking about them, is going to go away. Um, the question is, how do you foster breakthroughs in energy technology with little to no public funding? And I wanted to ask you to point to examples or models of a couple of different policies or programs that are doing a good job of that now. Um, I, there's, there's one that I know is everyone's favorite, um, but, but what, are, what are a couple of different examples at the federal or state level that are fostering or promoting energy innovation without a lot of money? Let me, let me pick up on, um, on Jesse's point. I mean, one way to do it without direct investment is through regulation. Uh, and, and so, if you look in California, for example, just passed, I think within the last six months or nine months, a mandate that um, a certain amount of uh, storage technology capacity has to be online by a certain date. Um, and, and I think that th this is part of what we need to start thinking of doing. And Jesse's right that many of the RPS uh, statutes that are out there state by state largely support existing technologies. That's the way, you know, in a sense they were designed. They really weren't designed, unfortunately, as an innovation tool, but they could be redesigned as such. And I think if you start to look at uh, mandates that uh, require a true portfolio uh, of both existing and innovative technologies do it state by state through a utility system. And at the end of the day, you know, if we're thinking about who has the money, uh, unfortunately the utilities are the ones with the strongest balance sheets of, of uh, most of the companies in the United States. Uh, so I think that's is at least a, a way to begin to think about using an existing tool with some modifications um, to begin to drive innovation uh, going forward. Um, you know, if you look to Europe, there are a number of countries that actually mandate, <coughs> again, you could, you could disagree with this, but mandate solar or other technologies on in new building construction. Um, and Spain has done this, and again, you could argue that this may have led to some of their problems, but, uh, but nevertheless, there are tools out there to be used. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say that this often is not a big money problem. Uh, you know, again, the states over the last nine years have spent about four billion of their own money. Each year, DOE's clean energy budget arguably is four or five billion. Um, I'd say take 10% of it uh, and use it to match state activities in this area uh, on a systematic basis, um, and that's not being done. Very interesting regulation. Yeah, old, old, at the state, it's still alive. It, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two, two things I would add um, in terms of the, some of the state incentives and RPS. Um, I, I think in the area that we're in, and, we, and you know, the, the, among our 400 companies, every, everyone expects that subsidies for this industry will not and should not be in perpetuity. Um, what we'd very much like to see, and maybe this is a redesign of an RPS and other kinds of, of, of tax mechanisms, is to see, te to see these incentives that might be technology specific that would encourage new technologies to, to come in at, at greater subsidies, but then to understand the pathway towards sunsetting those subsidies, but for them to stay in place with some declines that are long enough to get to economies of scale. Yeah. Now, exactly how you design that formula is complicated, but I think there's a, there's a, there's a formula there that would incent further improvement in economies of scale and, and reduction of cost that would be really valuable. Um, the other thing I, I would add, actually, uh, Rob had mentioned a book that Richard Lester um, and uh, David Hart had put out recently. One of the recommendations in that, in that book was for regional uh, uh, innovation investment boards uh, that could be state or multi-state partnerships, public-private partnerships, that w where those funds for doing these regional innovation investments would come from utilities, from a system benefit charge, which is the way EPR used to be funded before we had uh, you know, deregulation in the industry. And basically that was part of the defunding of 
of R&D funding from the utility industry was, you know, as we started to, uh, to, to change and, and deregulate the industry, a lot, that's led to, uh, to less investment. Um, we could actually, you know, there are opportunities that could be looked at at the state or regional level to require investments, uh, R&D investments in, um, by utilities, but then to pull that activity into, some, into a state and public-private partnership uh, that would, uh, wouldn't force every utility to repeat the same damn pilot over again, which is what happened in the smart grid arena today, yeah. but actually to learn from each other and to accelerate the way innovation can work. Yeah, I think that's an important point, and when it comes back to state regulation, I mean, utilities are legally mandated not to be early adopters of advanced technology. They're, they're mandated to provide least cost, Problem. least risk services to their customers, and so, you know, you, you've got new technologies looking for a place to land in the market, and most utilities have to look at that and say, legally, I can't invest in that, or my regulators won't let me get a rate of return on that investment. I have to go with the standard bread and butter, you know, natural gas plant. Um, and there are, you know, sort of exceptions in certain utility commissions that are, uh, or, or there are public funds raised through system benefit charges or public purpose charges that help uh, uh, try to make investments in those early stage technologies. Um, I, I'm familiar from my previous experience in Oregon with the Energy Trust of Oregon, which is a public-private uh, state-funded um, organization that receives a portion of the taxpayer funds from, or ratepayer funds from the system benefit charge, and portion of that goes to invest in the above market extra costs of those early technologies. That's why there's a commercial wind energy industry in the Northwest. You're able to get those, uh, those first wind farms online in the Northwest, let the utilities go kick the tires, say, yep, this thing works, it's not going to blow up the grid. Um, there's, I think there's challenges like that that um, have to be made uh, throughout the country. That could be a state-by-state -state, um, change in the regulatory mandates, or it could be um, a way for the federal government to incentivize those activities, something like a race to the top, a certain amount of federal funding drawn, um, you know, from uh, for perhaps from uh, oil and gas royalty resources, um, or you know, or from uh, a very small um, uh, national charge on on uh, uh, ratepayers through a wires charge fee, which is something that was debated in the previous Congress, and then distribute that funds out to states in a sort of federalist model to fund some of this stuff. So I think there's some creative thought that can be done around um, how you how you you I mean you how we have to turn utilities into early adopters of these advanced technologies. They're not going to get anywhere. Now, one thing I meant, uh, I meant to say, I mean, along the same lines, now, if you look to the decision in Massachusetts to approve part of the power output from the Cape Wind project, um, under existing law, uh, that utility commission approved about an 18 cent rate, which is above uh, your, which is above your conventional power rate, and it did it um, because under existing law. Uh, utility commissions are required and permitted to look at economic development benefits of those decisions. Uh, and the case was made that it would produce manufacturing, jobs benefits, economic benefits to justify that above market rate. In New Jersey right now, uh, again under Governor Christie, a bi this is a fairly bipartisan effort, uh, he has the most aggressive so-called renewable energy credit program to finance offshore wind. So I think you're starting to see uh, states, because of the economic development benefits from these technologies, starting to be creative in figuring out how to mandate uh, or, or create markets for new technologies. Uh, and one other thing to add is sort of you're talking about leveraging limited resources for a long, long distance gain. Um, uh, we put out a brief today uh, discussing a clean energy deployment administration. It should be a public bank, uh, essentially like the U.S. Export Import Bank or the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, two great models which both take limited taxpayer investments and then use that funding to leverage significant private sector investment to help American firms overseas and enter to markets or, or close deals or finance um, deals. Uh, the Clean Energy Deployment Administration, which has been proposed by uh, Senators uh, Bingaman and Murkowski on a bipartisan basis and passed actually twice out of the Senate Energy Committee, so it's a well-vetted proposal, would have a similar model and it would be designed to replace the troubled loan guarantee program uh, and loan programs office that um, is the subject, of course, of today's uh, circus over on the Hill. Um, and I think that we need to look at the experiences of Solyndra, look at the operation of the loan guarantee program over the last few years, and take some valuable lessons from that experience in order to set up a more effective agency um, that would be independent from OMB, from the Office of Management Budget at the White House, be independent probably from Department of Energy as well, uh, and staffed with the kinds of experts like the Exim Bank and like OPIC um, that can leverage a limited one-time investment of taxpayer resources to, you know, for an order of magnitude greater impact in terms of unlocking private sector investment in advanced energy technology commercialization 
legislation, which would be its mandate. Help those uh, entrepreneurs and firms that are currently stranded by a big gap between what venture capital can take uh, as a bite out of the apple, you know, tens of millions of dollar kinds of investments, and the types of billion dollar or hundreds of million dollars investments you need to build your first full-scale power generation facility or first full-scale factory, um, which is usually the realm where private equity or, or, or traditional lenders have to play, but they're not going to tolerate those risks on their own. So I have a real fundamental private sector gap here that can be filled, I, I think, quite effectively with a limited amount of federal resources. How effective has the loan guarantee program been at stimulating innovation? Is it, is it a good program? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's it's designed to address a critical shortcoming in the private sector, and so it's a you know it's a, it's the first tri step forward we made to do that, and the Congress uh, enacted in 2005. Um, I think there's a lot of things that could be improved. I mean, for first, it has one tool only; it has a loan guarantee. Um, you know, there's a lot of other financial tools to being used to mitigate risk and to unlock. Uh, private sector investment, and we should be able to use the best tool for the job that uses the limited, most limited amount of taxpayer resources and risk. Um, and the loan guarantee program can't do that. Um, it, it's uh, and it was, you know, was asked to do an awful lot very quickly, and I think that also um, uh, it probably undermines its optimality. I think the other big challenge of the loan guarantee program is that it faced pretty conflicting mandates uh, for, uh, to both uh, achieve stimulus objectives in terms of job creation and to take risks and bets on programs that were likely to fail. I mean, remember that this program was authorized by Congress to take risks and to lose up to two and a half billion dollars of taxpayer resources in order to leverage a significantly greater amount of investment. Um, initially, it was given six billion dollars. That was rated by for a couple other funds. But they have 2.5 billion dollars set aside to cover loan losses. So, you know, the loss of Solyndra even at 500 million dollars, is that was part of the intention of the program to take some bets that don't go that don't win, but if that is coupled with a, I think, confused with an objective for job creation, you can't say that it's succeeding at job creation when those companies go belly up. So I think we need to take, you know, we need to take some of those lessons and refocus uh, the objectives of a new organization like CETA, you know, really clearly on um, using the best tools for the job um, and uh, and focusing, you know, squarely on those advanced technology commercialization objectives and not really being seen as a job creation agency. In the long term, I think the portfolio will create a lot of jobs, but in the short term, you can't justify these programs like that. Um, if people want to uh, write down questions from the audience, we can start taking some, some questions. Um, is there, should we? Okay, great. Thanks. Loan guarantee in Solyndra. <laughs> yes. Um, isn't Opened any can of worms, so now we're stuck. <laughs> <clears throat> Isn't any loan guarantee program politically challenging because failures arrive sooner, more frequently, and more visibly than successes, no matter the funds available? Isn't this an argument for CETA? I mean, I think, yeah, it is a challenge. I think we need to take a long-term view. Um, I think that's one of the challenges of, you know, authorizing a program like this under stimulus, you know, under the stimulus bill and under stimulus policies where their expectations are for some pretty short-term returns. Um, you know, we do take the long view with some of our organizations. We take the long view with uh, the Exim Bank. We take the long view with OPEC. Um, and those programs return a profit to the federal treasury every year. Um, so I think we can see that if you can establish a portfolio of investments and allow folks to use the right tools and, and, and mitigate risk across that portfolio, that portfolio can perform quite well. I think the loan guarantee uh, portfolio that we've got now is performing quite well, and in the end, probably will um, be deemed a success. But I think it is a political challenge. We have to, and we have to have clear expectations when we create these agencies um, that these are long-term objectives. That you're not going to see the payoff from these things in a, an annual appropriation. The argument for a clean energy deployment administration is let's get that out of the annual appropriation process. Let's give it a one-time appropriation. Let those program managers uh, do their jobs, um, and then you know have annual reporting. But it's not going to be coming. For before Congress every year asking for another you know, couple billion dollars and trying to show the performance that's made one year at a time. Um, these programs can't really do that. Let's make one point about Solyndra that I, I haven't heard made. Um, you know, the, there's an argument to be made that, the, that, in effect, the underlying problem was more the fact that uh, it was a venture capital problem. Um, that is, uh, you know, a lot of people at the time, this was two years ago, I remember being in meetings in San Francisco where the company came up. Uh, that there was no way that it was possible for that company to uh, get to scale, to commercialization, purely with venture capital money. And this was, these were venture capital people who had looked, at the, had looked at the opportunity, decided not to invest, and didn't see an exit plan. Uh, because there was no, and this is the valley of death problem, uh, that there was a way truly to scale up that technology purely with VC money. 
And I, and I just mention that because not to, to uh, blame the company or the decisions in the loan guarantee program, but I think it's a larger problem in energy that we haven't, that we've relied too heavily on the VC model. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people in the VC community who will say that it's not appropriate to this industry because of the high capitalization requirements. So unless we figure out ways to use other capital, utility capital, uh, institutional capital, uh, we're not going to make progress in this area. Uh, I have a question specifically for, for you, Lou. Um, what policies are needed to promote carbon capture and storage technologies? Do you think states should institute such policies now? You know, I, you might want to ask Armin, who's in the next panel, uh, who knows much more about carbon capture and storage uh, than I do, but I, I think he would probably say uh, that if you have natural gas plants, uh, or other facilities or industrial plants uh, that state level or regional level mandates for capture is an appropriate uh, regulatory tool. But I'll leave it to him to, uh, to try to address that. Would that be something we could see at the state level? A, a state mandates for, for carbon capture? Um, again, I don't see why you couldn't. Um, you know, I mean, you do have Again, if California can institute a cap and trade system uh, in, a sense, in effect legally impose uh, you know, a cost on carbon, uh, I would think, in fact, I think it would be unfortunate uh, if uh, in doing so, and I haven't looked at their plan in detail, if that they haven't man mandated or required some kind of technological uh, effort to capture carbon. That would be the smartest way to do it. Yeah, I mean, as one example, both California and Washington State have um, maximum emissions performance limits for new coal-fired power plants. So this isn't an existing plant that's requiring retrofit, but if you mm -hmm. want to meet that limit going forward, you're not going to do it with a conventional coal-fired power plant with you know no capture of emissions. So you either have to build in capture into your technology, or you're not going to you know have access to those markets. Sure. Now, to date, technologies haven't been able to be demonstrated and moved across to the point where um, there are folks trying to build. There's, well, there's a couple of, one proposal in Washington um, to try to build those plants, but you know, there's one example of, uh, of a state uh, taking action to sort of, you know, essentially say there is a performance threshold. I don't care what technology you use to do it, but you know, if you can meet it, um, then you can have access to this market. Yeah. I, I would have a hard time thinking about how that, you know, at the state level, you could actually require and mandate and assume you can then finance or provi provide some of the financing to support carbon capture and sequestration. I mean, I, we're part of a 10-state regional greenhouse gas initiative in the Northeast, and the leakage problem is always in discussion about, you know, do you do this at, at this one state level? Do you try to, do you ship that dirty generation yeah. across state lines? It's all part of the same grid. I mean, that's, that's clearly one of the problems, but then it's also the cost of doing business in one state versus across state lines as well, uh, and the financing mechanism. So all of, all of those are huge issues, and the issue of venture capital or private investment, private investment isn't going to come into those sorts of initiatives yeah. unless they believe that the, the pricing signals and the regulatory framework is stable and certain long term. And I'm not sure, you know, for something of this scale you can do that at the state. Is it possible? I mean, we're going to see in the next year um, the, the federal greenhouse gas emission standards regulation um, for power plants. Is that going to be something that could drive you know, are, are the national greenhouse gas standards going to be something that, that could dr drive or push carbon capture? I think again, Armin probably knows this inside and out, but um, it, it's, it's possible um, and it certainly could establish performance incentives that could help um, drive some of these technologies or create a market for these technologies. I think it's difficult in an era where natural gas is super cheap um, to say that, you know, utilities have to build a coal plant with carbon capture at you know probably two times the cost of a gas yeah. plant with the same emissions profile. Um, so it's more likely, I, I think, switching. those, those uh, performance standards are, are likely to um, simply drive um, you know, new, new construction towards gas, which is where it's already going, which is sort of our business as usual trajectory for the next 20 years or so, unless we can um, get more innovative about, uh, about the technologies we're pursuing. Travis, you talked about uh, what's going on at the Pentagon with clean and renewable energy, and you said, well, everyone kind of knows what they're doing, but it's, it's still pretty new. You know, they just uh, started their, you know, just unveiled their operational energy strategy this summer, and, you know, when, when I talk to people at the Pentagon, they say really one of the keys to the success of this program is funding. Um, we're, we're looking at a lot of, of defense cuts. Can, can, these, can, can this operational energy strategy, can, can DOD's push to change the way it uses energy? It's going to require more expensive 
purchases to begin with, can that can that thrive if if it's also looking down the barrel of, of some significant cuts? Well, the budget thing is somewhat different, I think, with DOD uh, in terms of innovation for the very reason that some of the very biggest gains for uh, uh, efficiency improvements which translate into lower costs for DOD are not at all technological, they're operational. So um, if all we care about is having a greener Department of Defense, um, there's a lot of things to be done. But if we want to see those things actually reach a commercial scale that can actually have an impact for things like clean energy and competitiveness, we have to have an appropriate way that links the two. And it is challenging, and advocates are right to uh, um, uh, you know, identify early on that of course DOD is only going to act in its own self-interest. Um, the key is to using some sort of systematic way to see which of those self-interests align with certain technologies, because it's not the same across the board. And the problem with what at least I think we see so often now coming out about this is they're not sort of sorted out in a systematic way and like I said that's why they sort of get torn apart by people who think oh this isn't DOD's role it's not in their purview to be doing these things and it's because these things get all wrapped together and um, so I think well, and, and to be clear DOD is very clear their goal is not to have a green pentagon their goal is to use less oil mm -hmm. that, that that is what drives their goal so um, as they're striving to to meet that goal what are some specific things that, that the Pentagon can do that the, that the new operational energy office can do to use less oil and also you know are, are we going to be able to see the things that make things that have them use less oil and and push innovative energy technologies in a way that that could eventually reach the market yes what are I, some how, how you know what kinds of decisions can they make how can well I think it's um, we're not going to change the way DOD thinks so I think the thing we need to be focused on are the type of decisions that advocates like ourselves make and the types of things we're talking about. And I think one thing is, I mean the safest bet is to look at these things that, that go down this column uh, of tactical concerns because those are going to be the things that have a strong support from the services themselves, not just the Pentagon. Um, and they're going to bleed into the other things like stra uh, strategic concerns. So um, uh, batteries, for example, start out as a tactical concern that achieves uh, greater strategic capabilities, but it's important to see where it starts out. And that's going to be much easier to make a case for than something like alternative fuels, like I was mentioning, for the very reason that there isn't a tactical benefit. So we really do have to hinge everything on this idea that um, you know, price spikes are going to undermine DOD's operational objectives. That's a reasonable argument, but it's certainly not a, a given one. It's, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding that, and uh, as a result, a lot of controversy. So. Lou, something you, uh, I think it was either Lou or Peter, had, had talked about, um, you know, ARPA is great, Ar it, it, it is funding these, these fantastic breakthrough technologies, but there is still a question of how do you commercialize them, how do you bring them to market, and it doesn't really seem like that's within the purview of, of DOE or the ARPA-E program. How do, you, how do you cross the valley of death on that, again, without spending that money? Right. Well, uh, we actually are in conversations with ARPA-E to, to try to link their work more with, let's say, some of the state funds that are funding some of these new technologies, uh, with utilities, with state, some state players that otherwise um, you know, could be in the business of commercializing these technologies. So I think so far, they're thinking about it, it's something that I think they need to take up uh, because that's the gap in, in the, uh, that they have programmatically. They don't have immediate customer. Yeah, what I would add is, is you know, there's the, the kind of programs that are being done at small pilot scale that we and a lot of our counterparts in the states are doing, like the I6 Green, the DOE Innovation Ec Ecosystem programs, uh, the Regional Innovation Cluster initiatives that were in the America Competes Act. These should be seen as regional partners to things like ARPA-E. ARPA-E, as, as, a, as a central organization, can do some very good vetting and, and selecting of, of great projects and provide some level of support. But those projects are going to be much more successful if they get connected to, you know, to strong managers and entrepreneurs, to customers, to financers, to customer advisory councils, to policy makers in their region who can help them think about how to design the policy structures that would create market signals for them. That happens, and th that's the kind of stakeholder engagement that you see the, you know, across, uh, across a cluster. 
So being able to connect cluster, these cluster organizations as partners to co-support with ARPA-E these programs. And it's sort of similar scale, frankly. I think you could look at you know, if ARPA-E is sort of a half billion dollar a year, if you thought about a half billion dollars a year across all the states uh, supporting these public-private partnerships, it would make a world of difference for the early stage acceleration, commercialization, market, market linkages. It's not going to solve the scale. I mean, I think CETA and other mechanisms, green banks, private capital leverage, they still have to be solved for scale up. Yeah, so uh, just to plug a report that you probably find a few more copies still up in the back, we just released a report today on these two challenges, bridging the clean energy valleys of death and this early stage gap between you know, great idea in the lab um, and where you can really take it to the folks you know, in the regional innovation and the industrial clusters that are going to take those things into the market and then how do you scale those things up um, from there. And I think these state and federal partnerships are really important. I think you know, if you've been watching the Republican debates like I have um, over the last while, there's sort of this magical thing that happens when you take a bureaucrat from a state government and you put them at the federal government because the state government they can do Medicaid right they can do education right they can do everything right taking the federal government all of a sudden you know they get lobotomized or something when they walk through the uh, Forsyth building over in a uh, first all building over at the Department of Energy um, so I think we need to think about um, you know how do we build some political support with governors with states with regions with business of which of course can't do anything wrong um, and you know and figure out how we leverage some some of these great federal programs like RPE um, with some of the state uh, models and that's why we definitely call for both, you know, the need for something like RPE to cross this uh, translational gap, take a big bird's eye view at the challenges that we need, set some benchmarks and see what ideas are out there across the country. But we also need regional, really a full-fledged national, you know, regional innovation cluster strategy for the clean tech commercialization challenge. And, you know, programs like I6 are great. There's been some um, good effort to sort of figure out where we can shake existing money out of our current programs to do a little bit here and there. But I think we definitely need to be much more proactive um, about national and state or regional partnerships um, to address those commercialization gaps as well. A, a question for, uh, for, for Lou and Peter, which is, which, what are a couple of examples of state policies that have really been successful in, in driving innovation, in driving energy innovation? Well, I think that it is a, it's not just policies, it's mechanisms. Um, you can look at a number of the states that have, um, you know, this is exceedingly well, you know, the, a lot of the state, not just state energy offices, but these quasi-public state investment organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, so NYSERDA in New York, the Mass Clean Energy Center, the, what's now re been renamed the Connecticut Energy Investment and Finance Authority, which is also has a green bank as part of it. These are groups that are coming up with new financing partnership mechanisms to support early stage projects. Um, but also they are in many ways the partner to groups like us and others. Um, it, those have to be com you know, connected to whether it's an RPS or, or other mechanisms for commercialization or market adoption. It's also been, I think in some of these states, it's been the state as an early customer. Um, that's been, you know, th those programs are starting to get going in a much, in a similar way to DOD. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the states, when they get their act together, um, along with the campuses of the state university systems and, and state government, can be a great early adopter uh, for some of these technologies and, and energy efficiency as well. I mentioned also, I mean, something the state has, states have encouraged, but it's really a private sector initiative that I think uh, over the long term will make a significant difference, and that is leasing models. Um, you know, people talk about the cost, let's say take solar, uh, the cost of solar technology, 15, 20,000 for whatever uh, small system on a home. For the most part, that, that's a, that, that model is gone. Um, what you're seeing throughout the country now uh, are private companies, uh, fairly well capitalized, uh, that are offering, offering leasing uh, of those systems where essentially a customer just simply pays the utility price, uh, no additional upfront capital costs. Um, and, and, you know, that's a good financing tool. It's good to get more adopters. But I think that actually the most important thing, and this is happening in the fuel cell industry as well, um, is that it shifts the technology risk to the developer. I mean, one of the reasons why commercial and industrial customers, let's say the fuel cell industry, which I know reasonably well, uh, was very reluctant to, to, to take on those technologies in the last five or ten years is that they were early technologies, a lot of technology risks. You know, Harvard Medical School was not about to do that. They'd rather buy two diesel generators and, and call it quits. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, now you're getting those systems out more uh, because the developers are bundling tax credits, bundling incentives, bundling renewable energy credits, essentially t t retaining ownership of that 
uh, of those technologies. And I, and I hope over time what that model does is that if that developer sees that a new technology is cheaper, uh, will begin to uh, you know, not have that locked in, but replace those technologies with new cheaper technologies because they tend, they'll make a profit on it. Mm -hmm. So the incentives are getting properly aligned in that case for distributed generation, and that's purely a state-by-state -state approach. I, mean, it's, I think it's very innovative, very creative. Uh, it's a way for the, for the stuff to get adopted. And that's, that takes us into our, our last question. We have to wrap up. Uh, in addition to um, seeing this environment of fiscal austerity where the funding for a lot of this research is going to go away, it's also clear that we won't, will not see any kind of clean energy, federal clean energy policy in the next year or so. You know, certainly not climate change, certainly not renewable electricity standard. Um, you know, such regulations as are being put in place are being delayed, are being fought. Is it possible in this landscape to get to a point to get these to get wind and solar and, and geothermal to price parity. Is it possible, absent federal policy, to get to a point of 20, 15 percent renewable electricity? You know, if you if you've just got if you've just got state programs, you know, if if you've just got clusters and regional initiatives, is it possible to get there? Very short <laughs> answers, yes or no? Yeah. So my short answer yes. is, is no, and I think that the industries all need to wake up to that reality as well and come forward with a really clear roadmap for how they get from here to cost parity um, and in what period of time and what kinds of steps they're going to take to do that and say, and we need the federal government's partnership to do that. Um, they're going to have to begin a pretty aggressive effort, I think, to make that case that we are not asking for a perpetual subsidy here, unlike the oil and gas industry, which does have perpetual subsidy. We're trying to get a new technology that's ready for global export onto the market, and we need your help. Um, I would just say for DOD, it's optimistic because um, with the exception of maybe alternative fuels, there's many, many places where cost parity just doesn't matter. So even though there's budget austerity, if it provides a new capability they need, they'll spend the money. They always have. Peter, nationwide, is it possible to get there? I, I, well, we don't have the same prices across the country. So I think it, you have to look at it state by state or region by region. In some regions, yeah, I think you can get there. In others, for individual technologies, no, you won't. But I think there's another way of asking the question, can we make advances, accelerate deployment of renewables and energy efficiency and smart, smarter use of technology and things like demand response to, to bring down costs and end up with a similar cost in our energy infrastructure but, but a system that's more, that's cleaner? I think the answer to that is yes. Luke? Different question. I, I think price parity is possible, but I don't think it's actually the ultimate test. I think for many of these technologies, the question is, what are the offsetting economic benefits? And if there are offsetting economic benefits, if you have in-state industry, uh, you know, simply rate parity is not going to be the driver for the investment. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thanks.